Praise God. So God is good. I want you to take your Bibles, if you would, and uh, turn uh, to Acts chapter 13. We'll be gathering around there in just a few moments. The title of the message today is Overcoming Regrets. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you today, Lord, for your many blessings. I thank you, God, for this church family. God, I thank you for the giving. I thank you, Lord, for the serving. Lord, I know that there's people here that dearly love you. And God, I thank you, Lord, for the ones that you've brought here. And Lord, I just ask you right now, Lord, whatever you want to do with this church, it's in your hands. God, I pray, Lord, that you would just help us to be servants in your kingdom. And Lord, we pray, God, for Pastor Ryan and Rebecca. God, keep them safe. Lord, I know they're in the, the cold winter of Chicago, but God, I pray, Lord, that you would keep them warm. And God, I pray that you would supply their every need. And Lord, we pray, God, that you would just open doors of ministry for them. And God, we pray here today, God, for Jacksonville, for Orange Park, for Fleming Island, for Middleburg. And God, I pray, Lord, for this city, God, for our loved ones. And Jesus, I pray, God, that you would minister to the people of this city. And we give you glory. God, I pray today that you would hide me behind the cross. And I pray that Jesus alone would be seen in this place today, in your sanctuary, sanctuary a place that we come to worship you. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen. Uh, Let me just say, too, as we break into the word, last week we were in Colorado. I want to send you greetings from Pastor Gary Wilkerson, um, the son of David Wilkerson. We have a sister church there in Colorado Springs, and he was in a serious car accident, and he he really hurt his back seriously. And so when I had gone there a couple weeks ago just to help minister with the staff and help um, you, you know, just speak some things into the staff. And they had asked me to stay over and preach, but we were going into a Christmas, um, you know, just into a Christmas series, and I really couldn't miss. So they, they invited us to come back, and they were so gracious to fly Chris and the kids. We actually left the evening of Christmas Day and, um, and went in to preach. And I, I just want to just send you greetings from them. God is doing a good work there, and they're praying for us. We're really attached that way. We decided to stay a few days over. If you're on Facebook and you're a friend of mine, you have probably been nauseated at seeing all of the pictures uh, from, from the wintry snow. But we, we actually went snowmobile riding. Um, the day before we came back, it was 15 below zero. That's cold. And I had like warm-up pants. They weren't even like real, like anybody that's from the north, Canadians or whatever, it was like warm-up pants, and it just did not do the job. So my legs were frozen. And the next day we flew back, and it was 85 degrees here. So that was a change of 100 degrees in a day. So don't complain. And I brought you some cool weather. Everybody say, thank you, Pastor John. So very good. All right, here we go. Overcoming regret. Overcoming uh, regret. How many here today, how many you love Jesus? Amen. Praise God. Amen. If, you, if you're here today and there's no shout in your heart and I say that and you're like, yeah, yeah, uh, I want to tell you, I want, man, there's nothing greater you can do than to serve God. And I pray by the end of the day today that there's a shout in your heart. But uh, how many you love Jesus? How many you want to live a life of significance? And, and when I say that, let me just follow this because so much in the church, we go to people, you know, you have a significant life and it can be very self-serving. Because it's all about you and how significant. But I want to just say this to you, church. To live your life that way, you'll always come to an empty place. There's nobody that's on their deathbed that is, is, is looking around about their significance. You can't take any of this with you. If the life that you live, you don't live for significance for the kingdom of God and eternity, everything here passes away. So with that said, how many of you would like to live your life and significance for the kingdom of God. Amen. (laughs) Praise God. So I I really, um, today I want to talk about what that means and how that affects us. Every person here, every one of you, 1 Corinthians 12 says this, God has called all of us. Every one of you has a gift, has a calling, has a place to serve in the kingdom. God, God doesn't just call the pastors and then, you know, he's kind of finished with the list. Every one of us are parts of a body that fit together. And every part of that is important. How we serve, how we give. You know, hey, some people are called to talk. Other people are called to make coffee and be hospitable and just love people one-on-one. But I want to say this to you. If you think that the most important ministry that happens today is on the stage, you're wrong. 
I believe that the most important ministry that happens in this church today is right in these chairs. It's right in that cafe. It's ministering to people. It's engaging with people. It's caring about people. That's the gospel that Jesus came to give. And so today as we come into this time, we're stepping into a new year. We're stepping into 2016. And I want you to know that the most significant life that you can live is the life for Christ and the cross only he brings real change. How many of you know when a, when a um, politician says that he's bringing real hope and change, what does that mean? We're going to have just a little bit of change left in our pockets when he gets done, right? And it's not, hey, as Democrats, Republicans, and independents. So uh, it, it's just the real change that comes. It comes from Christ. It comes from God. Today is not a motivational speech. Today is a time of talking to you about finding out what your calling is, living out your, your, your walk, what God has called you to do, how he's called you to live. There's just something about coming into a new year. We're coming into 2016. And I know it's just a date. I mean, how many of you stayed up till midnight? And, you know, but, you know, it's just another day. But there's something really significant about the dates, how, uh, you know, we all can look back and go, this year this happened, that year it happened. And probably every one of us here has had difficult things that happened in 2015. And am I right about that? And every one of us here have had good things that's happened in 2015. But we stand at a place. We stand where we're stepping into to a future place of life and ministry. And today, I want to talk to you about what that means and what your life is and, and how your life can be used for the glory of God. Because so many people go so far with God and that's as far as they go. They never really find out the purpose that God has for them and then, and then, and then spends the time to walk it out. And today, that's important. The way you live your life, what God has called you to, these things are incredibly important. There's people that are here today and you love God. But somewhere along the line, you had a fire, there was a desire to serve God, and somewhere you've lost that. Today, God wants to rekindle something in your heart to serve him, not out of, listen, uh, we're, we're not here to manipulate, we're not here to, you know, uh, to try to motivate you, we're here to just simply speak truth. But I believe that if you ever get the heart of God, God wants to take your life and use it for his glory and for his purposes and for eternity. And so as we gather here today, God wants to restart something in your heart, rebirth something. And I believe for many of you uh, that this is a time that God wants to do something special as we step into this next year for you as an individual, uh, for your family, and for us as a church family. In Acts 13, as you turn there in, in verse 1, um, this, this time period is the early church. God had done amazing things in the book of Acts uh, earlier. And now the church, you, so, you sort of see a shift. We'll talk about this in the next few weeks. But you see a shift of the church, kind of the home base being Jerusalem, and then it moves to Antioch. The scripture says that believers were first called Christians at Antioch, which was little Christ. It was Christ moving in their lives. And in Jerusalem, there was, there was so much arguing over doctrine and, you know, do you, are you supposed to be circumcised? Should you not be circumcised? Do you keep law? And when the gospel got to Antioch, it was just preaching the truth of God's word and loving people. And listen, pagans were coming, Greeks were coming, Romans were coming, and God was doing a mighty work. That's a transformational church, and it's certainly what, what I have a desire for the Springs Church to be. And he was uh, working. This is 15 years after the Apostle Paul was saved. Go with me, if you would, in chapter 13 and verse 1. It says this. Among the prophets and the teachers of the church at Antioch of Syria were Barnabas, Simeon, called the black man, I assume because he was African American, Lucius from Cyrene, Manian, uh, the childhood companion of King Antipas. That's an entire story on its own. And then Saul which is the Apostle Paul. But one day as these men were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, dedicate Barnabas and Saul for the special work which I have called them. So after more fasting and prayer, the men laid their hands and they sent them 
on their way. Now, I want you to see this. God was doing a great work in, uh, in Antioch, but it wasn't just enough that they reached their city. It wasn't just enough that they go, hey, our families, our children, and our grandchildren are being reached, and thank God for what he's doing here in Antioch. They had a vision to go beyond the place that they were at. They looked up and they said, you know, there's a lost world out there. And the Holy Spirit began to deal with them and going, we have to take the gospel outside of these four walls. And I want to say this to you as a church family. Anytime that we start to be satisfied with me and my family and my home and my kids and my grandkids and we're saved and going to heaven, so I'm satisfied. I want to tell you that is not the heart of Jesus. I don't believe that's the Holy Spirit. When the Holy Spirit begins to move in your heart, you care about people that don't know. You care about people that you don't even know their names. And the Holy Spirit will begin to move on your heart. And so here you have these men and they're going to take uh, Barnabas and take uh, Saul, the, uh, the apostle Paul, and pray for them and send them out to go and reach the unreached, the people that don't know. And I pray to God, Springs Church, that this is our heart. You know, last year we're just a church three years, a little over three years old. Last year we gave $150,000 to missions out of this room right here. Thank God. Can we just thank God for that? And it's our heart. It's what we have a desire uh, to do, and we pray that he continues to move that way. Look with me, if you would, in verse 4. It says, So Barnabas and Saul were sent by the Holy Spirit, and they went down to the seaport of Seleucia, and they sailed for the island of Cyprus, which is, you know, Cyprus is just right off the coast in the middle of the, uh, of the Mediterranean Sea. And there in the town of Salamis, they went to the Jewish synagogue and preached the word of God, and John Mark went with them as their assistant, and that word means as a servant. So I want you to just get this picture. They go out. This is an exciting time. I, just asking across the room here, how many of you would like to go on a missions trip with the Apostle Paul? I mean, if we said this year, Apostle Paul magically somehow is going to be here and he's going to lead a missions team, who would want to sign up? Yeah, you may wait till I finish the story. Okay. <laughs> so... <laughs> So here, the Apostle Paul is going out. This is the first mission trip. And it's not, you know, a two-week mission trip. We're talking about three years that these men will be gone. And Paul and Barnabas, as they go along, they say, hey, John Mark, come along with us. We want you to assist us and stand with us. He's obviously, he's a younger man. And they're going out. They're launching out in ministry. And they're, it, I'm not going to go through and read all of it, but I'll just tell you the story a little bit. The first place that they show up, there's, um, there's a, a Jewish sorcerer, which I think is an oxymoron, but there's a Jewish sorcerer, and he's there, and he's coming against the message of the gospel. And Paul and Barnabas are trying to minister actually to the uh, governor of the area, and they're trying to tell him about Jesus. And, and this bar Jesus, this antichrist spirit, if you would, is trying to stand in the way. And so the apostle Paul comes up to him and says, hey, you're the devil. And then he strikes him with blindness. Praise God. You like that, huh? You wouldn't like it if anybody struck you with blindness, though, right? No, I'm just, you know, and listen, I know that Jesus is the healer, and some people say, well, God never, you know, uh, brings sickness. I want to say to you, I don't believe that, you know, in my own personal life or yours, I think if you're walking with God, I certainly don't think that God in heaven is up striking people with sickness. But listen, he makes this man blind. And in this moment that he, he turns this sorcerer blind, the governor looks and he goes, okay, this is pretty real right here. And the governor comes to Jesus. And I, I want you to see this. This is the first missions trip of the church. And God is doing amazing things. They're going across Cyprus. The governor's getting saved. People are getting saved. Lives are being changed. But along the way, I want you to see this with John Mark. Go down with me to verse 13 of chapter 13. It says, Paul and his companions then left Paphos by the ship for uh, Pamphylia and landing at the uh, port town of Perga. And there John Mark left them and returned to Jerusalem. But Paul and Barnabas traveled inland to Antioch of Pisidia. Now, here's the first thing that I want you to see is this. They come to this place and the Bible does not say why John Mark left. But he comes to a place and he quits. He comes to a place and he says, you know what? I'm done, I'm finished, I'm out of here. It wasn't just because, you know, he broke his leg or he became ill. Because Paul would have understood that. 
Whatever it was, we'll read about this in a moment, was so upsetting to Paul that two years later, Paul is like, you ain't going on a missions trip with me. Thank you, but no thank you. So when he leaves, he leaves in an unfaithful way. He quits. He forfeits the call that God has on his life. And I want you to see this. What an amazing opportunity. He is in the first missions trip of the church. Now, back in those days, he didn't know that that's really what we would be reading about 2,000 years later. But this was the opportunity that God laid in front of him. He had an opportunity to make a difference, to live a life of significance, to do something that would help to change the world that's around him for the glory of God. But he comes to this place and he goes, I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm going back home to Jerusalem. Thank you, but no thank you. Now, some people talk, if you read commentators and read through the scriptures, there's a few reasons that people come up with. They go, well, maybe he was homesick. Uh, some people say that, they didn't, that he didn't really care that Paul wasn't making new believers get circumcised. So he left to go back to Jerusalem. It was a doctrinal thing. Probably the most, what most people think is that it was really difficult and they had already had difficulty and now they're about to step in to the south of Asia and they are going into uncharted territory. So when they show up, it's not like, hey, we'll go to the first Methodist church or the first Baptist church. There's nothing there but pagans. There's pagan Jews, there's pagan Romans, and then the best guys that you come up with are the Jewish people who are stoning them and beating them, okay? Now, the Apostle Paul, when John Mark leaves, he and Barnabas are like, hey, you go your way, but God called me to go into this place and to preach the gospel, and by the power of God, I'm gonna go. So you leave, you stay, I don't really care, but God has called me to do something. How many love the Apostle Paul? <laughs> and his life was that way. I think he probably would not have been an easy guy to work for because it, he was a no-excuse guy. As a matter of fact, what would happen is they go on to this trip. He would go and preach the gospel. He would be stoned to death. How, how many would like that? And then raised from the dead. He in, in, in encountered one difficulty after another difficulty. And I want you to see, the apostle Paul had come to, to a place in his life that he was like, I don't care what you do, I'm serving God. He was whipped with uh, stripes on his back three times. He was shipwrecked. He was stoned. Uh, he was beaten and thrown in prison. And every time that it happened, what does he do? He praises God and he keeps on going. How many of you like that guy? I, I, I love the Apostle Paul. But John Mark comes to a place and he goes, you know what? I'm going home. I'm going to go eat cornflakes. I'm going to go play video games, young people. And I'm done. I'm going to recluse back on my rec recliner. I'm going to get my remote, and it's going to be click, click, click. I, I don't want to be in the middle of this battle. It's too hard. It's too difficult. I'm out of here. You guys go on, but I'm finished. Anybody ever been at that place? And I can tell you, I've been at that place in my life before. And he, he comes to this place. He withdraws. He goes into a place, and it will be two years from the time that he walks away to the time that he comes back to Paul and Barnabas. And if you would, I want you to go over with me to chapter 15. And we'll read about when he comes back. It says in verse 36, after some time, Paul said to Barnabas, let's go back and visit each of the cities that we, we previously preached the word of the Lord that was on the first missionary journey. And now he's talking about what we will know is the second missionary journey and, uh, and see how the new believers are doing at the towns that they preached at before. And Barnabas agreed, but he wanted to take along John Mark. But Paul disagreed strongly since John Mark had deserted them in Pamphylia and had not continued with them in their work. Their disagreement was so sharp that they separated. Barnabas took John Mark with him and sailed to Cyprus. Now, I want you to see this. Their disagreement is so sharp that Barnabas, his name means son of encouragement. And he's saying, hey, and this is his cousin. John Mark, we'll see later in the scripture that this is his cousin. And he takes him under his wing. And John Mark, though, had to come to a place when he said, you know what? I'm not playing the video games anymore tired of the cornflakes, for whatever reason that he left, he came back to a place and he says, you know what, I, I'm not going to quit on God. 
He was honest. He had to go back to people that he had disappointed. You know, when I look at this, I look at people in my life, you know, that I don't want to disappoint. Chris is at the top of the list. Um, my kids, I don't want to disappoint. In ministry, Carter Conlon at Times Square Church, man, if I did something to disappoint him and he just looked at me and was like, John Bailey, you are a loser. I'd be like, dang, because I really like him. I really respect him. If you don't know who he is, go online. What a great man of God. But here's the apostle Paul and Barnabas that he led down in such a way that when John Mark signs up for the next missions trip, Paul goes, hey, pal, you're not going with me. You're a quitter. And quitters don't go with me. And li listen, not only that, but maybe one day God will restore you, but you're no way are you ready to do this. But when they separate and they go their way, John Mark goes with Barnabas and they go back the same path. Now, I want to say this to you because there's people that are here today. I know this. And at one point in your life, you had a fervor. You had a desire to serve God. You were involved in ministry. Yeah, hey, God, I want to serve. I want to go. I want to give. Lord, and your heart was on fire for the things of God. But somewhere, somehow, you either lost that fire or you haven't taken the time to really figure out what God has put you on this earth to do. And here, John Mark comes to this place, and he could, it would be the easiest thing in the world to just go, man, I let down the Apostle Paul. Who would want to let down the Apostle Paul? I bet that guy could just look at you and you would go, I'm so sorry. Um, but in spite of the shame, in spite of the disappointment, in spite of the re regrets, John Mark, to his credit, goes, you know what? I'm not going back to that place. I'm going to get up and I'm going to move forward with God because Paul didn't save me. Jesus saved me. And how many know that Jesus is always merciful? Amen. Can we thank God? Because every one of us here today are trophies of his grace. And God has not, he's not done with you. He's not finished with you. But he does want you to come to an honest place like John Mark that says, hey, stop living your life in foolishness. Stop living your life for yourself. Live your life for significance in the kingdom. God is not finished with you yet. But there's got to be something honest in your heart that says, you know what? I don't care what anybody says or thinks. I'm going after God. And Barnabas stands at this place when Paul's like, no, nah, you ain't going with me. I'm taking Silas and Luke and we're going the other direction. And he has to say, no, God has called me. He's equipped me. And I'm going and I'm going to serve God with all of my life today. If we're here and you go 2015 and before that, you've come to a place and you've abdicated the work and the ministry that God has for you. And you said, no, I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. It's too hard. Whatever the reason, it doesn't matter what the reason is. Whatever the reason is, it's wrong because God has called you and now he's equipping you and now he wants to send you to people that are hurting and broken. You know, I've, I've heard people say to me, you know, pastor, I'm just too busy. What do you think I'm going to say back to you? I have a word from the Lord. Stop being so busy. Do you hear what I'm saying? If you're too busy to serve God, then you're too busy. You're living a life that God never called you to live. He has called you. He has equipped you. And your life belongs to him. Now, if you go, man, I'm at work all the time. Can I just say this to you? Myself and the other pastors that are here, we have to go out to find lost people. We don't have too many lost people in our offices. A few, but not too many. Uh, we have to go find lost people. So if I'm going to go witness, I've got to go out and find lost people and minister to them. If you work a job... In the secular world, guess what? You are surrounded with lost people that God has sent you to go and reach. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you should stand on your desk tomorrow and preach John 3.16 to the whole office. But God has called you to those people, to reach those people, to love those people, to disciple those people. God has called you somewhere to do something. Don't tell me. That God has just called you to come sit in a church and absorb and never give back. I don't believe it. That's a lie. It's a lie of the enemy. God has called you to something. You know, I've heard uh, single moms and stay-at-home moms 
and they're going, man, my whole life is just watching kids and, you know, I don't, how, how am I going to serve God? My whole life is just watching kids. You, you know, I want to say this to you. Single moms and moms that are stay at home are some of the, the people in my life that I've come across. Man, they, they need help and encouragement because it's hard. Any guy here want to stay home with three or four kids that are screaming and changing diapers all day? Every man said no to that unless you're crazy. And I know you're not going to say it with your wife sitting next to you because she's going to give you, there's the diaper bag. <laughs> but if I came to you and I said, listen, next week I'm starting a mommy and me play group, Pastor John here, and I'm going to meet with all the single moms uh, down at Chick-fil-A and we're going to have just a day with me and all the single moms and a mommy and me play date. You would think I'd lost my mind. First of all, the first thing that I would go, I have no idea exactly, you know, what they go through. Uh, you know, little bits and pieces from what well, my wife has told me. But I don't really understand what they've been through. But listen, if you're here today and you're a single mom or a stay-at-home mom, I guarantee you in your neighborhood and even in this, this church, there are people that need to be encouraged and reached out to me, uh, reach out to. Don't tell me that God doesn't have a ministry for you to do. That is a lie of the enemy. Now, maybe you haven't taken the time to find that out. And maybe you've abdicated it. But God has something for every man, every woman, every teenager in this place. You are a part, if you know Jesus, you're a part of the body of Christ. And God has something for you to do. And stepping into 2016, I would say this to you. This is the most important thing that God wants to speak into your life as you move forward. It's more important than anything because this is the significance of a life lived for the kingdom. Amen? So here, John Mark, with all this failure, with walking away, with what he's done, he comes to this place and he goes, you know what? I'm not going to live here. I'm going to take my knocks. The apostle Paul is going to look at me with those disappointing eyes. But God has called me, and I'm going. I'm not going to sit in my house in Jerusalem and die. I am called for a greater purpose for the kingdom. If you would, I want you to go to Colossians. And I want you to see about 10 years later what happens in the life of John Mark. Four and verse 10, it says, Aristarchus, who was in prison with me, this is the Apostle Paul, he's writing, this is what's called the prison epistles, it's about 60 AD. It's about 10 years after the event of him leaving and walking away. He sends you greetings, as, as does uh, Mark, uh, Barnabas's cousin, so this is the same Mark, Barnabas's cousin, as you were instructed before, make Mark welcome if he comes your way. Uh, Jesus, the one that we call Justice, this is, this is a, a man there that's called Justice, also sends his greetings. They're the only Jewish believers among my co-workers that are working with me here for the kingdom of God. And what a comfort they have been. I want you to see, 10 years later, now he goes, they go their separate ways. Paul goes, not taking you. Uh, I'm, going, uh, I'm going up, and he would actually go and preach the gospel in Macedonia, the first gospel preaching uh, in Europe. And it may have been great wisdom on his part, because when they went to Macedonia, if you know the story, they go to Philippi, and they would be beaten by the people in the town and thrown into prison. And it says in the midnight hour, they begin to call on God. But perhaps if Barnabas was in that situation, it may have been too much for him to handle. But God had a place and he had a time. And 10 years later, he comes to this spot. Paul's in prison. He's writing these messages and he says this. John Mark, the cousin of Barnabas, thank God that he's here because he's a help to me in ministry. He's one of the only Jewish believers that stands with me. How many of you know that God did a work of grace in John Mark? Amen? Not finished. Go with me, if you would, to 1 Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5 and verse 13. They say, your, your sister church here in Babylon sends you greetings. And so does my son Mark, 
Greet each other with Christian love. Now, this is about 61 or 62 AD, um, about a year or two after he's with Paul. And now he's with Peter. And Peter refers to him as a son in the gospel. So look at the work that God has done in John Mark. Now, there's a little bit of discrepancy about if John Mark was actually the person that wrote the book of Mark. But most people believe that this is what happened. While he is here with Peter, right in, during this time frame, he, Peter starts to tell all the stories of Jesus. Jesus healed the sick. Uh, Jesus died at the cross and rose on the third day. And while he's telling the story, John Mark, he's dictating it, and John Mark is writing the stories of Peter down, and that will become what is the second gospel, Matthew, Mark, written by John Mark, who abandoned the gospel, who walked away, who left, who was a quitter, but now he pins through the stories of Peter, the gospel of Mark. How many think that's a pretty great thing to be used for in the gospel? We're not done. Go to second. Timothy, if you would, chapter 4. We'll go down to verse 9. And he says, uh, Peter, or, uh, Timothy, in verse 9, he says, Timothy, please come as soon as you can. Demas has deserted me because he loves the things of this life and has gone to Thessalonica. So now you have people that are deserting Paul. This is the last gospel, uh, last book that the apostle Paul would write. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. How many would like to disappoint somebody who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament? But he comes back to this place. People are deserting Paul. They're leaving Paul. He's about to be martyred for the faith. And he says, uh, Demas has left me. And he's gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia. And Titus has gone to Dalma uh, Dalmatia. Only Luke is here with me. And Luke would be the one that would write the, the book of Acts. But he says this, bring Mark with you when you come, for he will be helpful to me in my ministry. In some of you, in some of your translations, it says that he will be beneficial for my ministry. So here we are. Now this is about 13 or 14 years later, after his failure, after his quitting, and the Apostle Paul comes back and says, you know what? God has done an amazing work in the life of John Mark. And you know what? Would you please send him to me? Because he is a real blessing to me. He is an encouragement. He is a help. He'll strengthen my hands. Of everybody that he could call for, he says, will you send John Mark? How many of you think that God did an amazing work in the life of John Mark? Amen. Praise God. Church history tells us this. You can't actually go and find it in the Bible, but church historians Early, early church fathers tell this, that after Paul would be martyred in Rome, uh, John Mark would leave there, and he would go to a city that's in, um, that's in Egypt. You can go home and read this. The name of the city was Alexandria. And he's noted as the person, the first person to bring the gospel into that region of northern Africa. How many of you maybe that have African roots can say thank God for that? He's the first one to go. And he plants several churches. He becomes the first bishop of Alexandria. This is now a, about 15 to 20 years. It's getting into 70, 71, 72 AD, which is about 20 years after the first missionary journey. And God has done an amazing work through this man. He's taking the gospel to this area. He's going into uncharted territories. And this is then the story that is told of John Mark. That the pagans that were in that area hated Christ and they hated the gospel. So they took John Mark, this is what history tells us, and they tied him to horses. And they ran the horses through the city until John Mark died being drugged across the streets of Alexandria. He never one time recanted. He never one time quit. He never one time turned away from what God had called him to do. And now you take a man who was a quitter. You take a man who forfeited his calling in the gospel, who said, no, I'm done. I'm out of here. But only a few years later, he becomes this great man of God. And when he gave his life for the gospel, it was so remarkable in the hearts and the lives of the people that lived in that region that they were so touched that a revival began to break out. Because how many know that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church? And folks, here's my point to you today. Maybe you're here and you go someplace in my life. I went to a certain place with God and God has a call on my life. That call never stops. 
it never ends. The callings of God are without repentance. So if you're here, God has a call. He has a purpose for your life. And I'm saying as we step into 2016, will you find out what that calling is? And if you've left it, will you come back to it? But whatever he's called you to do, let God begin to stir in your heart because there has to be a place there. If, if you love Jesus, not, this isn't rules and it's not religion, but it's, man, when you love Jesus, you want your life to be lived with significance. And you can't do that if you're not finding out what God has called you to do and to be for his sake in the gospel. And today, guys, listen, this is not a motivational speech. I'm not here to try to ramp you up. This is truth. This is gospel. It's the word of God. And listen, what would happen if in Orange Park, Jacksonville, Middleburg, Fleming Island, Mandarin, to, the, to our city, Southside, wherever it is, if we would get a heart that says, God, whatever you've called me to do, I want to do it. Lord, I want to serve. I want to give. I want to go. I want to disciple. And as we step into this new year, you find what God has called you to do, and you go, God, here I am. And don't live life for yourself. And stop being entertained by this world. And stop loving everything that this world has to give. And just go, you know what, God? I just want to serve you. Now, I understand. I'm not against having fun. I just went on vacation and I rode the snowmobile. But you know what? It is not very soon thereafter that I know I am not called to the top of a mountain in Colorado. I'm called to see a city won for the sake of the gospel in Jesus. You hear what I'm saying? This is what my life is. Hey, thank God for the break. But when your life becomes the break, you got a problem, Houston. You know, when, you're, when your life is the vacation and then you stop in to see what God will do in church, you've missed it. Your life is church. And then go have yourself a vacation here and there. But this has to be the life of the church. And folks, listen, if you're here and you're going, well, Pastor John, you just want to, you know, have a big church. And listen, I died to that a long time ago. And anybody that knows me knows that. We died to that a long time ago. I have no desire to brag on me or the church. We have a Savior that I want to brag on, and I want to brag on Jesus. And I'm here to tell you, there are people that you come in contact with every day that nobody else can reach, but you can reach. And God has called us here for such a time as this. And I'm saying to you, brothers and sisters, what has God called you to? Don't tell me nothing, because that's a lie of the enemy. That's a lie. God has called you to something. Find out what that is, and whatever it costs you, and whatever you have to do, you find that place. And I want to tell you what, God will work in such a powerful way. That, my folks, is what God wants in 2016. Amen? It's not hype, and it's not fluff, and it's not entertainment, and it's not flashing lights. He wants your heart. He wants your life. And if you can ever get that, God will change this world. Folks, I don't think it's by accident. That God, while we were on the mission field, tapped us on the shoulder and said, come back to this place, to your home, to your neighborhood, and to start a church. God called us to do this. And God has called you here to be a part of this. And if that's you and that's your heart, I just say this. Let's be the body of Christ. Jesus is the head. I'm not the head. He's the head. But let him be the head. And every one of us function as parts of the body and I will tell you, God can do just like he did in Alexandria, just like he did on Cyprus, just like he did in the south of, uh, of Turkey, which is where Asia Minor was at. It says that every man and woman heard the gospel. Why can't that happen? Right here in Orange Park, Jacksonville, why can't that happen here? It can happen if my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face. God will move and he'll restore the land. My prayer is this, is that when the annals of our church are talked about 20 years from now, if Jesus doesn't come back, that there'll be a time that people go, God started a church where there was compromise, there was everything else, and God raised the church up for his glory. That's you and that's me and that's every one of you. Young people, you stand in a position to do something great for the kingdom. You can't live futile lives and produce the kingdom. You have to live a life that brings honor and glory to Jesus. Amen? He's called you. He's equipped you. Find out what that is and do it with all of your heart. Amen?
Can we give God glory for that? Praise God. <laughs> Worship team. Worship team, come if you would. You know, if you're here today and you go, wow, this message has just been for saved people. It's not for people who are non-believers. I just want to say this to you. With every, Everybody stay still. We're going to an altar call here. Let me say this to you. I live so much of my life in futility. I know what it is to be lost. I know what it is to be without God. And I'm telling you, if you're here and you don't know Jesus today, there's nothing that you can do that will really mean anything for eternity. I don't care how rich you are. I don't care how much money you give to poor people. Listen, all those poor people will die one day unless they know Jesus. It's only what we do for eternity that really makes our lives significant. And if you're here today and you go, I don't really know Jesus, I'm sorry to tell you this, but it's true. Your life is really insignificant. The only thing that brings real significance to our life is Christ and the cross and Jesus alive in you. And one day when we see him and we walk on streets of gold, that's real. That's significant. And today, if you don't know him, don't go another day. You want to start 2016 off right? Give your life to Christ. There's nothing better that you can do. With every head bowed, would you do that right now? And just begin to pray in this room. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, can you just admit that your life is futile? And he will bring real eternal significance. But you have to do what John Mark did. He became broken. He became humble. And he said, God, I don't care what anybody else says. I want to live for you. And if you're here today and the cry of your heart is, I don't care what anybody else in this room thinks, but God, I want to serve you. I want you to come into this life. I want something that's real. I want something that's genuine. I'm, I'm tired. I've seen all the plastic religion that this world has. I have no desire for that. But God, will you do a real work of significance in my life? If that's you, will you raise your hand because I want to pray for you today. I want to pray and I want to ask God to move in your life. Yes, ma'am. Who else is here? Across this room, who else is here? Will you just raise your hand today? Jesus, today. Today, Lord. Anybody else? Praise God. Father God. Now to the rest of you, we'll pray with this dear woman in just a moment. The rest of you that are here today, this is my call to you. And this is an altar. It's an altar for anybody that would come. If you're here today and you would say, as a believer, as a part of the body of Christ, I don't want to live my life in futility. Maybe you've abdicated. Maybe you've walked away. Maybe you've quit to some degree. But you're here today and you're going, God, I want you to do something real and fresh in my life. God, I want to see you move in this generation. And maybe you're here and you go, yeah, God, I love God and I'm serving God. I'm here in church but you just know that there's more. You just know that God wants to do something in your life and he's tapping, but you're not really hearing and you're going, God, I don't want to live my life for futile things. I want to live my life for eternity. I want every, everybody here to stand if you would. And if that's you, this person that raised their hand for salvation and any other person that's here that just says, God, today I want you to work in my life. No more excuses. No more quitting. No more stopping. God, you've got a plan for my life, and I want to find out what that is, and I want to do it. I'm going to ask you across this place to just come, to just come and gather around this altar. Man, John Mark had to come and face up to Paul. It wasn't easy, but he did it. Today is going to take a moment of honesty inside of you that says, God, don't let me live my life for in futility. I want to serve you, love, give, disciple, evangelize. God, whatever it is that you want to send me into in 2016, God, I want to be that man. I want to be that woman. Come and gather around and pray. Praise God. Praise God. Church, we're, we're still 5 till 12, so you just stay where you're at. I'm going to ask something right now. I'm going to ask every teenager, young adult, if you're here and you're under the age of 20, John Mark was a young man when he started, and he came to a place of quitting. 
And if you're here and you're under that age, I want you to, I know we have mostly over here, but they're all over the sanctuary. And I want you to come and stand right in the middle of this altar. Will you do that today? I know that we have young people that love God, that love Jesus. I thank God for our youth ministry. But I'm going to ask every one of you, if you're under 20, I want you to just step out and come and stand here. Come and stand here with us if you would. I'm going to ask the leaders, the youth leaders that are here as well. Listen, in this day, in the age that we live in, there's so much that come at these young people. So much that tells them to quit. So much that tells them to walk away. So much that tells them that what they're doing isn't important. I'm here to tell you today, the life that you live is important. And Christ loves you. God loves you. He's got a plan for you. He's got a purpose for you. Don't quit. Don't give up. Find out what he's called you to do and do it. Don't live your life for futility. God has something that he wants to work out in your heart that's so real and so good. Let me just ask, any other adults that just want to come and stand around these, you're welcome to. You certainly don't have to. Leaders, elders, deacons, parents. I want to pray for these young people. I'm actually, I want to pray for these young people. There was a day that America was a Christian nation. I think most everybody that's honest will admit that we're in a post-Christian era. We're not the majority, we're the minority. But that doesn't mean that God's happy with that. It means that God wants to revitalize, that God wants to do something real. He wants to do more than smoke machines and flashing lights. He wants to do a deep work in your heart. And today, I'm just praying today that God would find his way in that life of yours you would say, God, here I am, whatever you want to do, and whatever he calls you to, man, you'd be like the Apostle Paul. He got beaten, he got stoned, he raised up, he he was put into jail, he walked with God, he praised God, listen, whatever comes your way, you you just set your sails and say, I'm walking with God, and it doesn't matter what comes against me, I'm going to serve God, and he's going to give me the ability to do it. When I'm weak, he's strong. When I can't, he can When it's impossible with me, nothing is ever impossible with God. And today he wants to drop that into your heart. Father God, I pray right now, Lord, for these young people. God, every one of them will face battles. Lord, social media. Lord, some of them will have professors and uh, teachers in their schools that will teach them all sorts of things that go against the word of God. Jesus, I pray today that you would hold them, that you would keep them. God, that you would do a deep work in their heart. And God, I pray that their lives, God, would be significant for the kingdom. God, I pray, Lord, that you would do a mighty work. Lord, I pray, God, that that attitude and heart of quitting, God, Lord, it would be a thousand miles, God, from where they're at. And Jesus, I pray, Lord, that they would find the will and the purposes, that they'll never live with regret. They'll never live in the past. Their failures will never define them. But they will live for the purposes of the kingdom of God. And God, I pray this for teenagers. And I pray this, God, for every adult in this room. Lord God, I pray that we would never be defined by our failures. We would be defined by the mercy and the grace of God. We love you today. Church, can we give God glory today in this place? Hallelujah. Praise God. We're going to sing this song one more time. And just mean it with all of your heart. Praise God. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. I am found. I am yours. I am loved. I make yours. I have life. I can breathe. I am here. I am free as you are.
praise God. Can we give God glory? Hallelujah, Jesus. Praise God. Praise God. Father God, I pray, Lord. God, I pray in this room. Lord, if anyone that's here, Lord, has abdicated that call. Lord, has quit. Lord, it's, maybe they've been hurt. God, maybe they've gone through difficulty. And Lord, maybe they were burnt out. Whatever the reason. But God, today is a new day. Today is a new day. And God, I pray, Lord, for men and women to take steps of faith, oh God, that moves beyond the pain of the past and moves into a future of living, knowing the will of God and doing the will of God. God, everybody that you've called us to go to and to reach, Lord, I pray, God, that you'd help us to do that. Lord, for your glory and for the glory of the kingdom of God. In Jesus' mighty name, praise God. God is good today. Amen. He is good today. Praise God. Praise God. All right, as you go, I'm dismissing you. Tell somebody God is going to move in my life in 2016. God bless you.